joining in mm. and thanks IMA for supporting us and sharing this uh, program with the doctors. As we all know, doctors, I think, are the most stressed lot. But the way God has made, you know, we can't see our own self. We need a mirror to see our own self. Similarly, I think we doctors, when we keep treating patients, we somehow miss looking at our own self and our own health. So today, it's an opportunity for us to actually look at where do we score when it comes to our wellness and health. And we will, you know, be sharing few things with all of you, which will actually make your mind go roller coaster. But at the end, you will come out with what you need to do in this year to stay healthy. So welcome everybody. And I'm going to share my screen now. So if you can see the screen, please give me a thumbs up in the chat box. If you can see the screen, please give me a thumbs up. Thank you. So of course, what we are going to talk today is health. Food, medicine, disease. Symptoms approach, epigenetics. What is it that we need to rethink to bring health back into our bodies again? I am Dr. Preeti Nanda Sibal and a graduate from Amritsar Medical College and a fellowship holder from A4M. And I personally feel that healthcare today is going through a phase which is like when somebody said, Earth is not flat. Right? Dr. Preeti, can you go and say on the project in the mode, screen mode, your, uh, your PPT, go, go on the projection mode? Thank you. Thank you. So, basically, it's that type of a shock. We have done excellent work with, you know, allopathic conventional medicine in acute cases. But now we have so much of overload of chronic diseases that a rethinking cap needs to be put. It is the same, you know, when Einstein came out with his philosophy and we all were like, this is crap. And it took us a long time to actually agree to him. Darwin's theory, no better example to tell us that anything takes time to seep into our system and that's what is hap happening with healthcare today. If we actually look at what is cancer, what is diabetes, pancreatitis, autoimmune disease, arthritis, renal disease, irritable bowel disease, cardiovascular disease, even depression, autism, all of them at the core are chronic inflammation. Right. One word for all diseases. So Cleveland Clinic, you know, really describes this very beautifully. What is a disease? In old times, people used to think that a disease was some actual entity or thing <laughs> which had got into the body in some way and was there lined hidden and secreted and was to be cast out. This idea which we now know to be true only in a few specific instances was at one time general. The conclusion is that all disease is disordered function. And bringing that disordered function to an order is what is the role of medicine. Right? So beautiful. And that's where evidence-based scientific functional medicine comes into play. We all know traditional wellness, right? And of course, we are all scientific modern doctors and we have been helping people live healthy for so many years. Beautiful way to bridge this gap between these two is this evidence-based scientific functional medicine, which means bringing disordered function to order and putting the system in place again. So functional medicine basically matrix says that 
physiology and function needs to be seen and the clinical imbalances have to be put back into balance the basic things Gaur, in uh, this Gaurav, can you mute yourself requesting everybody to mute themselves otherwise you keep coming in the spotlight thank you the basic thing in this is the pillars if you look at the slide are sleep and relaxation exercise and movement nutrition stress relationships all of these are important to be healthy and to create health today and this is what functional medicine focuses on at the base this is not all we all know that we are more bacteria than human genes almost 80% of the genes we have in our body today are gut bacterial genes and that is what defines how healthy we are and this is what is taking us to more and more personalized medicine because we now know that the right hand and the left hand of the same person will have a microbiome which is different between 35 to 50 percent imagine how personalization personalized health is becoming it was always but at least i was not aware of that and therefore the secret to wellness isn't a secret anymore it's complete science and to take this forward i now invite dr vivek to please discuss more on how wellness is science and what is it that we need to be aware about to stay well and i'm going Thank to you. start sharing dr vivek and you can share your screen yes thank you dr priti thank you uh, that was a very good uh, initiation introduction to the concept of functional medicine of course right at the beginning uh, let me just introduce myself uh, among other things uh, apart from being a ophthalmic surgeon uh, i did uh, uh, my fellowship in bhrt bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and longevity medicine for twin endocrinology usa and uh, uh, then pursued more and more my career went in the direction of uh, hormonal optimization and here i am as part of functional medicine and hormonal uh, hormone optimization uh, trying to uh, promote as even as part of the ima program the concept of functional medicine so uh, right at the beginning i would like to mention that uh, functional medicine is actually being practiced by all of us it's just that in our routine practice we are so used to following protocols Yes. we don't notice that parts of those protocols are very much uh, in line or aligned with what we call today's functional medicine the only reason we need to discuss this as a separate entity is just like when we discuss specialization when we have various specializations in our medical field we always like to focus on specializations let's say a general surgeon laparoscopic surgeon surgeon who's doing more of uh, one particular type of surgery onco surgery but in general we need for that focus to happen so that's why i would say that uh, it is not actually a very a new concept it is just that this concept is being uh, understood and pursued uh, in a more uh, well uh, focused manner so just for sake of understanding just for sake sake of clarity if you look at uh, wellness wellness or well being as a concept so i think we all understand as doctors that our final goal is not to treat or eliminate the disease uh, treating the disease is one part of the goal but our final goal is also to make sure that the person leads a positive uh, is in a state of positive health and can live a very productive uh, life and satisfactory life in other words happiness you know happiness which which can which is fairly abstract so that's where the feeling or the or, or wellness comes in but even if you were to take wellness as an abstract feeling it actually is can be quite objective so you can have different kinds of wellness and there are eight dimensions of wellness emotional spiritual intellectual the physical wellness environmental wellness financial occupational and the social wellness so when you have all these aspects well balanced uh, that really leads to happiness so wellness though it is in a way an abstract or it's a emotion or a feeling that one can one can uh describe it is it is very much a science and we are as scientists every doctor just by our very nature of uh, being a doctor uh we have to be scientists that means our mind should constantly think 
in terms of scientific evidence. That's why evidence-based uh, practice uh, becomes a very important part of what we do. The other, th uh, other, fact, uh, other point I would like to mention over here specifically is because a lot of focus of functional medicine goes on food and nutrition. And therefore, the idea of eating food is like we say, do you eat to live or live to eat? The idea of food is not just to get the calories and survive. The idea of food is that that food carries mess is a messenger that carries various elements that improves or optimizes the functions of various cells. So I won't go more deeper into that because the experts in the panel will discuss that aspect more in detail. However, I will take six of these uh, factors of uh, wellness out of the eight. And uh, I have specifically included even the career because as doctors and professionals, uh, I have we need to focus on our career and there is a very important part of a career that will eventually lead to something called as burnout. A lot of people will talk about burnouts, but we do not know, we don't explain, if we don't have uh, an idea of how exactly to approach this. And I know that there is one IMA committee called uh, Doctors for Doctors that is specifically uh, addressing this and have often been part of their activities. But emotional health, so the spiritual health, intellectual and physical. So emotional, very simple, it's the ability to understand and cope with your feelings. So that's what our goal is. Spiritual is of course, uh, one's meaning of life. So if you really find a meaning in your life or if you are still searching, then you're not, uh, you're not in spiritual wellness. Intellectual is easy to understand because you expand your knowledge, your skill and creativity. So physical and intellectual or physical and, and I won't say mental, physical and intellectual health is very easy to understand people and easy to even objectify or uh, be objective about. And social health is your relationship is important. So once you look at all these, uh, then you start looking at medicine as a science to achieve these, then the perspective is quite different. Because if you look at spiritual as a, an art, uh, it's going to be doing spiritual as a way of life, that's going to be different. But when you look at spiritual as a part of science and evidence-based medicine practiced in that sphere, then it sort of qualifies to be included in functional medicine. So that's a very important aspect to understand the meaning of the word. The definition of functional medicine is actually quite obvious uh, in the sense it's the meaning of functional medicine, sorry, is more obvious when you look at the definition. It has, it's a long definition, but it covers everything. So basically it is an evolutionary type of medicine. Important to realize that functional medicine, like even uh, mo uh, modern scientific medicine is constantly evolving. It's never, never fixed, it's dynamic. And it's particularly better to address the healthcare of the 21st century, where you could say in the 20th century, most of the diseases related to uh, poverty, uh, infectious diseases have already been sorted out and looking at wellness, particularly in the mental or the spiritual uh, sector. So here you address the underlying cause of the disease, root cause. That is the most important fundamental principle of functional medicine. You don't look at only what the disease is. For example, if you think of diabetes, you don't just think of sugar levels. And we know that. It's not that it's something new to us. It's a systems-based approach, and I'll explain what that means in the next slide. The, all the factors, health, wellness, diseases, are taken into consideration. So if somebody says, is it holistic? It's not holistic that we are doing all different kinds of medicine. It is holistic in the sense we look at body, mind, spirit, and the community. So the term holistic can be applied to various aspects of what we do. It is necessarily personalized, and it is a therapeutic partnership. That means this is one place. So far, a large part of the medicine or conventional medicine practice is doctor-centric or patient or hospital centric or institutions centric. Whereas a functional medicine looks at it from the patient's point of view and customizes to the patient. So it's just the change of approach, change of perspective. But finally, it is the same uh, wine in different bottles. Now, just to illustrate this, just imagine this is a, 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 a tree with a, with a trunk, leaves uh, and the roots. So there are many factors that you don't see, like inflammation, stress, poor diet, toxins, lack of sleep. And we all know the impact. It's not that diseases are new. It's just that we know about it. But in functional medicine, we actually sit and try to analyze its impact and try to see whether those also are, can be addressed. And then if you look at what you see on the top, you see hormone imbalances, you see thyroid issues, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's diabetes, cancer, autoimmune diseases. So these are all the things and one tends to call them different diseases because it helps for understanding to classify them and understand. But you know, when a human being walks in, you don't 
classify that human being as having that disease. So you have very nicely pointed out by Dr. Preeti that it is chronic inflammation that may be underlying all this or an imbalance, metabolic imbalance, something happened at the mitochondrial level, something happening at the biochemical level. So let's say that in this patient, a dominant factor is, let's say, high blood sugar. Okay, in that case, we just label that as diabetes. But you know very well, diabetes is not only about the sugars. Diabetes is about how you look at all the organs, all the systems. So if you were to look at diabetes from a functional point of view, again, most of you who are practicing medicine will say, we, we do that. It's just that we don't, we don't call it functional medicine because we don't do it in, in the same depth as a functional medicine practitioner would do. So where, where does that take us? So system-based approach we do. We're not looking at what, what is happening. The sugar is high, the BP is high. We are looking at which system is affected. Is it, is it the, uh, the cardiac system? Is it uh, the respiratory system? Is it all com the combination of these? What is the impact on the neuro system, particularly the autonomic nervous system? On the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the skeletal system. Is it uh, purely an injury or is it with osteoporosis? What is uh, the rate of healing? All these various factors come in. So when you look at functional medicine, you, you look at the same disease trying to look at all the systems just in order to understand which are systems affected. And you will usually discover that in most of these metabolic diseases, all the systems are affected. If you approach them system-wise, you will probably uh, get to where we want, that is wellness or well-being. So just take the endocrine system. That's where I have my focus. So again, in functional medicine itself, uh, there's, you can't have functional medicine practices that does uh, is an expert on all the aspects of functional medicine. So when I figure, focus on the hormones, yes, traditionally, you know, they talk about the various chakras, but that is not science for me. Maybe it's a different science. I don't say that's not scientific. It is not scientific in the way we understand science. And therefore, we have to understand it and try to find, form that bridge. But what we do understand is there are the various uh, uh, endocrine systems, and you cannot just say that if it's a diabetes, then there's something wrong with the uh, beta cells of the pancreas. That's, that's a very, um, uh, very, very narrow-minded view. It invariably is in, involving the thyroids, the adrenals, uh, the ovaries, uh, the testicles, hypothalamus, pituitary, they all work together. So therefore, the approach to evidence-based functional medicine is essentially nutritional op optimization, lifestyle changes, hormonal balance, and detox. So these are all terms which are there, but it's not done separately. It has to be done concomitantly and together. Lastly, just to summarize, if I were to put all this together, it's very important the way in which you approach it. You don't start off with the treating the disease. If you start with the foundation, let's say vitamin D, B12, omegas, I'm just giving examples. And then on that, you build on the thyroid issues or there are some other uh, uh, probiotics or metformin is required. I'm just giving examples. And then you find that, okay, in most cases, that's all that you need to do and the body will take care of the rest. However, in some cases, you have to replace the issues. I'm talking from the hormonal point of view. You could take any, any approach, functional approach, and use this pyramid. And then you find that the actual treatment of the disease becomes very less, less dependent on the medicine. And of course, avoiding substance abuse, diet, exercise, detox, and sleep and stress management has to be done throughout, if what, irrespective of what form of medicine you follow. So this is uh, the pillars that you find of evidence-based functional medicine, where the foundation is nutrition, you have lifestyle, diet, hormones, biophysics, and detox. These are the elements that we need to attend. Now, here we are trying to, uh, for, in order to make you understand, we'll have a series of, uh, of, of such sessions, trying to take individually some of hey, Dr. Vivek, your mic is on mute. Uh, it was the host that muted me, so it's uh, it's probably telling me that I've, I've exceeded my time limit. So please uh, go ahead. I've, uh, I've closed. So I want to hand over now to uh, Dr. Anish, the veteran. Is, I'm handing over to you, so you can handle the next aspect, aspect as I uh, give them a little bit of an overview on the hormonal aspects of functional medicine. Please go. Thank you very much, Dr. Vivek, for explaining and beautiful and scientific concept of functional medicine. And thank you very much, Dr. Preeti. Uh, she had beautifully explain about the functional medicine. So today, uh, all the pillars that Dr. Vivek had told about, one of the pillars that I want to talk is uh, energy metabolism, what the, we are missing, and the nutrition, all of us, what we are missing. I am Dr. Anish Musa. I am MBBS, an ophthalmologist, and also I am certified with IFM. 
So here we go about uh, nutrition. See, we all know food is a medicine. Most of us are ignoring food as a medicine. And now uh, many patients walk in my clinic, you know, they have a eight to 10 medicine they are taking with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So now the medicine has their food. So if we ignore food as a medicine, eventually in our life, we, we end up with a medicine uh, as a food. So basically my fundamental, or if you look at the broadly functional medicine fundamental, then this is how most people develop chronic disease. See here in functional medicine, we don't talk about the acute disease. We are doing the best thing in conventional medicine. We have base surgery, we have base emergency approaches. Right now, we are talking about the chronic complex disorder where we have to change our thinking. We have to change our mind to understand this kind of chronic conditions. So if we talk about a simple understanding of uh, chronic disease, then I would like to show you what the functional abnormality in that particular patient because of that things they are developing disease. So if you see broad way of disease development, then this is what, uh, what the theory, my theory is. We exposed to some kind of toxins in our life. Like, you know, we talk about the chemical exposure, air pollution, heavy metals, and we can think about the chronic infections, stress, and these things and alcohol. So eventually we built a chronic toxic load in our body. Same time, we have a deficiency of nutrition. So as we go in the life, we eventually build a toxic and we eventually have a deficiency of nutrition. So just think in a body, if we have a more toxic load and if we have a low nutrition, then how can body or cell maintain the homeostasis? And that is the, uh, that is the basic fundamental of system or functional abnormality. So eventually we start with an one system dysfunction. Maybe some patient develop a metabolic dysfunction or some patient develop a hormone dysfunction depending upon their genetics. But this is usually we start looking and we start developing disease like this. One of the major physiology in our body. So if we compare the conventional medicine versus in functional medicines, and I consider functional medicine is more of a physiology. We want to talk about the functions of the body. So today I'm going to give you some idea about the basic fundamental physiology that is energy production. As we all know that mitochondria is creating energy in our body. Now I want to give you some idea what is basically mitochondria we all know, but something I would like to give you an uh, as an extra thoughts that you can think about. In our body, each and every cell contains more than 500 mitochondria in a cell. If I talk about the cardiac cell, in one single cardiac cell, we have 5,000 mitochondria. And just imagine that that cardiac cell is occupying 50% of space in cytoplasm with mitochondria. And they are producing e immense uh, amount of energy. Do you know? In you know, one second, how much ATP we are producing? We are actually an energy factory. In a in single second, we are producing 1 million ATP in our body. So think about if your brain doesn't have enough mitochondria, enough ATP, how they can function. So even that is linked to depression, that is linked to some kind of neurodegeneration and these things. If we talk about the weight of mitochondria, then 10% of body weight is because of mitochondria. Just think that if you are 60 kg of weight, then 6 kg of your body is because of mitochondria. And this mitochondrial disease, and now in 21st century, you are exposed to so many chemicals and so many toxins. we are destroying our mitochondria. And because of mitochondria, we have a very uh, different kind of disease and these things. I want to correct, connect this mitochondria with an evidence-based nutrition. Even we can check this nutrition in our own, uh, in our own lab. We all know this TCA cycle that, you know, from the food like in protein, carbohydrate, we are producing energy and ATP. And we all learn these things in our physiology books. What I want to emphasize and what I want to show you is each and every organic acid metabolized, they require cofactor. That enzymes require a cofactor. If you look at this TCA cycle, each and every step, Either they require a B vitamins or they may require some minerals. The most common mineral in TCA cycle is magnesium, iron, zinc. And if you look at the B vitamin, then B2, B6, B12, folate, and certain amino acid we require for, for TCA cycle. So if you want to burn food, and if you want to convert that one molecule of fat into 36 ATP, then we require and complete uh, these cycles. And 
nowadays in the science we can measure this organic acid in the urine apart from the blood investigation we all are doing this blood investigation in our patient but even that is not sufficient in finding out the minor deficiency in that particular patient but tca cycle we can measure in organic acid in our urine and this things so that is all we need to understand this nowadays we are passing through many nutritional deficiency and nutritional deficiency is also one of the contributing factor of uh, disease and disease development in, in that sense if i talk about the digestion mitochondrial nutrition if you want to produce an enough atp and if you want to get away from the fatigue and the fatigue is a most common sign we are seeing in a, each and every patient and if we talk about diet nutrition then this is a common nutrition that required for energy production if i talk about the magnesium do you know that more than 300 according to me it's more than 900 reaction that is that that is you no know, cell required magnesium magnesium is a cofactor in more than 300 reaction in each and every cell so from just imagine from our head or brain to the toe we require magnesium and magnesium is widely uh, deficient in our soil we have enough calcium in our supplements and our foods and this is but we are actually devoid of magnesium we talk about the iron 73% of women in india right now they are iron deficient i'm just talking about the major mineral i'm not talking about the minor mineral and b12 and this things we all we see that you know patients we should walk to a clinic and we run only one test vitamin d and 99% of patients they walk in my clinic they have a low vitamin d deficiency low vitamin d they are vitamin d deficient this all nutrient are taking a place in some kind of development uh, of a uh, health and wellness and all kind of disease and this just want to give you some myths that is what uh, today's my objective is to just give you idea about you know what and how functional medicine how we think and we see the thing differently see we consider in conventional medicine that all vitamins are same but that is a typical myth not all vitamins are same i will give you two example of vitamins we all know folic acid folic acid is not vitamin b9 the vitamin b9 that discovered in science is 5 tetra hydromethyl folate and the basic version is 6s so all the vitamins that are available in the market they are different from and they all are not same folic acid is a synthetic version of vitamin b9 and if you take a folic acid and folic acid has to be converted into the active folate and they require methyl donor so if you give a folic acid to somebody they also subsequently develop methyl beta or b12 deficiency because conversion of that folic acid to active form they require b12 if you are not giving that active forms same way if you talk about the b12 b12 forms in it comes in uh, three different forms like an cyanocobalamin that is inactive forms that doesn't contain a methyl donor so if we talk about the krebs cycle we particularly talk about the active vitamins and that is if we talk about this b9 and b12 they are methyl donor and and just for your surprise if i talk about the genetics then 30 to 40% of indian population they having some kind of methylation defect that the most common genetic variation is mthfr and now in a science or in a evidence we can check that genetics if somebody is carrying that genetics we cannot prescribe folic acid they patient required active folate the methyl donor and this methylation cycle is very much prominent for hormone metabolism for energy metabolism for neurotransmitter metabolism so methylation is a primary mechanism that is happening in in a cell level second myth you know we we think about the our body can absorb any any form of mineral that is a myth our body cannot absorb the mineral if they are not in specific forms just give a simple example of zinc and magnesium see we all know salt like talk about salt if we dissolve the salt in the water they completely completely soluble they come in ionic form and then body can take and sodium this will not happen with an zinc oxide or magnesium oxide magnesium oxide is not a water soluble just just think about the scientific evidence if we take an magnesium oxide that magnesium oxide is not a water soluble so how we can dissociate the magnesium from the oxide do we have any enzyme in our body that can that can break down this bridge of magnesium and oxide we cannot take this that is out so for any mineral and that is called bioavailability of nutrient and mineral that is the most important point we are uh, consider in functional medicine so if your mineral is not uh, not water soluble if they are not coming in the ionic form your body cannot take so all minerals all the forms of are same 
we need to select the therapeutic minerals and that is we should look at the evidence what are the bioavailable minerals are there. you always consider that you know rda is enough for this kind of therapeutic intervention see maintenance is entirely different thing and therapeutic intervention is an, is a different thing when we talk about the therapeutic intervention we require a specific form of minerals and the specific form of mineral should be in a higher dosage that what we want rda is just to rule out the disease and just to maintain the health and as we understand the chronic disease this patient required more of nutrition and more of uh, even we should go beyond the rda and this things we also we also look at the look at the wrong report when we look at the uh, mineral or uh, vitamin deficiency we usually thinking you know standard range is enough for identifying the nutritional deficiency just give a simple example of magnesium one only 1% of magnesium that is stored in a in a serum so rest of 99% of serum is actually intracellular if we check and serum magnesium and if serum magnesium come to a normal range that doesn't mean that patient is not in magnesium deficient we should check and advanced testing like an rbc magnesium right now it's not available in india but this is what i want to show you that standard range is not enough for identification of nutritional deficiency so we run testing like just look at this one if we, if we, if we run this kind of testing and when it's come to the magnesium you can see magnesium is dr musa sorry yeah. but you will have to speed it up a little i think now it's dr praveen's time we are taking up yeah yeah please please is my last slide so thank you very much dr priti to remind me so just want to show you the standard versus optimal range when we are looking for optimal function actually we have to look at the optimal range so here you can see magnesium is although in the standard range but that is not optimal even we are missing one step we always check in nutrient individually we should check at the ratio clear cut in this patient we can see calcium is higher compared to the magnesium so that is not a good thing if you look at the ferritin if you look at the all vitamin what i mentioned here they are in the standard range but according to me this patient is having deficiency of all the vitamins and they are not optimal that is what uh, uh, my uh, view on a functional medicine and nutrition and evidence based nutrition thank you very much now i i invite dr pravin saxena to talk about the toxicity and his view on a functional medicine thank you very much Uh, thanks dr anish and uh, uh, vivek and uh, priti spoke so well i think uh, i just want to start with a small thing and i hope you like it uh, this is har ghadi badal rahi hai roop zindagi what i mean to tell you is when i started in 1990 i completed my mbbs after that i did my post graduation in radiology and somewhere i felt there was something which we are uh, now with the practice i started practicing autism for the last uh, 20 years and i had worked on some cases where uh, the kind of crowd which used to come to my clinic was very aware autistic parents are very they do google search they work with all the questions and all that they come and now what i see in the general practice also uh, but dealing with some simple stuffs also the people come with a lot of preparedness so i just want to uh, for the young doctors i would like you to urge look into some of the perspectives what we are talking about uh, we are not we are not just i'm talk, i'm well, i uh, think that there is a kind of um, uh, thing called we need to be uh, we have to be probably um, i worked in a area called functional imaging and uh, the kind of work we started working on thing is it was basically uh, work with autism where we started telling other what is in the brain actually we did a site cd scan subsequently we did a mri also nothing was found and later on when we do that in the eeg and we did that uh, spec scan and pet scan that uh, this was the functional imaging so what happens is that i would like you people to understand there the role of functional medicine uh, as well as functional imaging um, i will start from where uh, dr vivek has left maybe i just want to have uh, the kind of thing holistic approach what we have been talking about okay this is holistic and all that but i believe that uh, i am not able to still try to understand why this cholesterol issues are so happening and all that if i deal only with the cholesterol if i deal only with this heart and blood vessels and if i don't look into something like fatty liver what the patient is having what is the kind of constipation he has got 
what is the kind of lead uh, uh, things and all that so we need as a doctor we have we have a bigger role now we need to connect with all the dots connecting all the dots is going to give you a complete picture uh, uh, yes dr musa was absolutely right magnesium deficiency everything plays so uh, doctors uh, some somewhere uh, we started talking about uh, toxicity and i can always tell you we had read so many things in robins uh, the used to be etiopathogenesis we used to read about uh, similar simple things we i we had a challenge case like dilated cardiomyopathy and the patient started up this guy is going to be a, uh, just giving a small brief actually so he says why the hell i got dilated cardiomyopathy his parents are normal everything is normal so we need to we have to make him understand what dr musa has told just now about the mitochondrial cytopathy mitochondrial cytopathy what is the cause when we looked into robins it was told that dlcm is idiopathic idiopathic is number 1 number 2 number 3 okay you have different things later but i want to tell you we need to look into all the angles and start working on mthfr i have done enough of mthfr and we don't even look into now the moment we start looking at homocysteine levels uh, i started right uh, the thing is everyone has to be on the same page uh, what happens is that homocysteine i'm not looking for what uh, this i'm looking for mthfr i'm looking for some things so what i believe is we need to connect all the dots and really i can always tell you a simple patient also who comes to you for a wellness or some strange thing vitamin b12 also it can be a big uh, subject and if you try to try to use a excel sheet try to see what are the things here or what is the gi function so this particular thing Uh, this gi microbiome what uh, priti ji was telling this is amazing i think i had never um, understood some things i during my practice of ultrasonography which was a big practice i used to have and i used to tell okay yeah thoda chalta hai thoda sa ultrasound uh, fatty liver hai and they used to ask me what to do and all that similarly everyone used to tell that i said okay you just cut down your fats and all that probably this is causing to my surprise when i started looking into that and it it was a big uh, uh, thing when we when, when we started um, uh, looking at then this is not that easy actually uh, we we felt yes i had to do lot of other things fatty liver for us now when we practice this particular stuff uh, i do a lot of detoxifications and i can always tell you when i started doing detox in 2003 and 2004 i had a difficulty in getting the tests and all that uh, we used to send uh, old tests what we call all the way to great plains in us and uh, we used to uh, talk about mercury toxicity we used to talk about cadmium arsenic now that things have become slightly easier in the sense the patient oh yeah i can always tell you one thing when doctor Because you don't uh, diagnose di- lead toxicity just by looking at the bluish line, because it by the time there is a uh, you uh, get into anemia and anemia, all the there is a big kind of uh, disarray which happens, and you need to pick up early. You need to pick up when the blood levels are thirty, forty, or something like that. So that is what we are trying to focus on. That, and I can always tell you, a simple person walks to me, and I, I try to work with my ultrasound. I just check. for is uh, the first thing i'd like to look at is the oral mucosa and apart from that then when you ask the patient to open the mouth just see that that's a simple thing try to record yeah. things uh, see the kind of amalgams what he has yeah. got and once you have got that amalgams yeah. and you are sure this you are dealing with some big toxicity and all that this is very simple thing i had worked with migraine removed the to- amalgams worked with uh, parkinsonism worked with psoriasis and you know the cause was the amalgam which is causing the problem so amalgam has got something like silver uh, uh, filling which is called but it is not just it is not silver it is lead mercury so many things uh, that uh, get combined but this is a very broad sp- thing actually and um, i started working on uh, a, uh, a thing called biophysics and it really excites me because i had been always on that uh, as a radiologist we started working with the x ray ultrasound and we worked on that ecg all these things are electrophysiology and uh, what happens with this biophysics is you can make a big change in the patient and you can always diagnose things in a very simple and subtle way and uh, these are all the things which we felt Uh, as as it is, I felt I it was you no know, for me uh, pulse electromagnetic field uh, something like ECP something like 
hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This were not included in our curriculum. Uh, as an MBBS graduate, you just come out and we are absolutely, when we look into, uh, we have to look into that because the kind of person who is coming to you, he is not coming as a simple patient. He comes with a lot of questions. He says, why the hell everyone has got the same toxicity? Why I got into this problem? So you need to really uh, work it out. Uh, trying to, at the same time, you need to give the, uh, them answers. You need to treat him also. Yes, uh, Dr. Vivek's that one liner was amazing. Diabetes is not just beta cells of pancreas, and uh, it's we uh, it is a by default. We started understanding what is magnesium doing, what is the selenium doing, and I can always tell you, um, uh, trying to work with a lot of uh, ultrasound guided interventions. I try to work it out, uh, but I can always tell you. Uh, I am uh, really serious about this. This approach, if we can work it out in a proper way, we can find uh, really the really answers. The answers are very simple. For any complex problem also is there, the answers are, are very simple. So I keep telling that, I keep singing, hey, bhai, zara dekke chalo, aage bhi nahi, piche bhi, upar hi nahi, niche bhi. I want to tell you that niche because what happens is that we are going against the gravity. We are not grounding properly. We are uh, Nietzsche and uh, the way we are using the uh, toxic water, which is toxic, uh, air pollution, what we are talking about. And somehow this is a big, big things. And um, I somehow, uh, uh, there is a small prescription we used to, my uncle used to give a prescription and you just give hand it over there to the patient. And that would not have been enough in this present day practice. Uh, they pe those people have done it. It, uh, it was great, but I don't think they could have done it. Um, Musa, can you share my screen uh, for a second? I just wanted to uh, showcase uh, because this is one thing which we always, uh, uh, can you share that? Uh, okay, okay. share screen. I, I'm doing that. I'm doing that. And uh, what oh, oh, these are the very various scientific ways to deal with the toxicity, uh, which I believe can be worked out. And uh, uh, this is one thing which always chronic some. Uh, this is the heavy metal poisoning is a big issue which we started working on that. And I went on to take the board certification for chronic clinical mental toxicology. This is something which I always feel we need to uh, respect the environment and all that. And we are paying a heavy price for this industrialization and modernization. And uh, what I want to focus is, is the most difficult thing, which is uh, uh, most overworked organ, which, which you can always tell you is the liver. And uh, we used to get away with a lot of fasting and all that, but I find it very, very challenging because the kind of chemicals which are overloaded now, it is causing a big dent in your thing. Just by fasting, just by some things, it helps but uh, to not do that extent. But you, what are the things which are against? It, even your mattress, what you are sleeping in the mattress, they keep outgassing. The, you know what is dominated uh, the BFRs? You have uh, EB, uh, so many things, uh, bisphenols, even your toothpaste when we talk about, even we are soap. So we are inundated, bombarded with a lot of toxins in, every day. And uh, you don't, need not to be an alcoholic. We used to think that, okay, uh, we, I used to diagnose into 1994, ultrasound-wise, we used to diagnose in uh, ultrasound, and we used to like fatty liver, Achha, how much do you drink and all that. That was the standard thing. And uh, people used to tell, Are, ye bol dega pura, whatever what is it but i don't think people are uh, taking alcohol these days nobody is not uh, they, but the kind of jo chal raha hai india mein what is uh, india mein chal raha hai fog chal raha hai fog mere bhai fog is what you have got all the chemicals people are spraying like everything these are all uh, toxic things which your liver is not able to handle and it has got all endocrine disrupting chemicals and all that. If we can tell some this particular thing, what I mean to say is my uh, uh, elders used to tell, All right, you don't smoke and you don't uh, uh, go it into alcohol. This was the healthy mantra. And now what is the healthy mantra? There are so many things you need to follow. The moment we are getting into so many, uh, you have to work it out. Uh, we'll be discussing about all these things later. But I can always tell you a, row, a simple thing, what Dr. Musa was mentioning about glutathione, selenium, zinc. So many things need to be done for uh, uh, this dealing with all this. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Praveen, we will have to uh, squeeze in. We have some questions then. But yes, quickly, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Praveen, 
Hello. Tell me, Dr. Priti. Haan, I said you could finish the slides, but a little quickly. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I thought the other way. I, I thought it is almost uh, okay. I'll just, uh, this is almost done. Actually, I just wanted to tell you ki, that is a simple thing which we used to think that it is a fatty liver uh, that give you a sort of lot of dividends, in fact. And uh, I used to think that just by cutting down this. Uh, cholesterol and all that fatty liver used to get clean. But I can always tell you, this is one of the good markers we have. You don't have to wait for all the tests available in the world to get things uh, described that person. person. And uh, up, I can always tell you what I tell my patients is the way you keep your face clean, the way you keep your uh, toes clean, you need to see that your liver also should be clean, your all internal organs should be clean. That's the kind of thing you get a perfect uh, health. So uh, these are uh, some things which are not known about uh, some of the patients, basically. You can talk to the patients. I give them a KBC question. What is the largest excretory or in the uh, in the body and I give choices one is kidney second one is uh, liver third one is uh, your lungs fourth one is skin and you know most of the doctor most of the people who come to me for a prayer thing they tell it is the kidney largest excretory organ which is being overlooked is the skin so uh, I try to uh, and uh, we as doctors have to teach the people also so that unless they understand this is these are the things which we can so most of the time we uh, this toxicity and all that we try to remove some things from your kidney or from your um, uh, system as well as from the skin by simple methodologies which can be simple thing like a heliotherapy which is called light therapy again biophysics and uh, uh, something like uh, electromagnetic field and all that. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen also does a good detox and all that. Yes, we do use something like EDTA for an established case of a lead toxicity. The way we were told about, we, use, we read in Satoshkar Pharmacology about uh, using penicillamine, D-penicillamine for uh, Wilson's disease. We are using the same thing. The only thing is we are trying to see that what best suits you. It is all in our curriculum only. Uh, this is not, uh, this should not be confused with because there are so many detoxes. People keep talking about that. But you have all the doctors have got the kind of thing. First, we are, we have to see that. Uh, his other renal function, everything is normal, then we can work it out. So, so these are my few thoughts about how we can uh, address uh, some of the issues, which as a, I felt as a, a normal conventional doctor, I was missing in that. That's all, Preeti. This is my... Thank, yeah. thank you, Dr. Praveen. And I think this is a great way of staying young and staying well. Right. And before I take up questions, so I have few questions and I request all the doctors who have joined in, please, if you have any questions, share in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask also. Uh, Dr. Vivek, I will want uh, you to just explain about the four sessions which we will be having once a week right. because I think that was the time I, by mistake, muted you. Uh, well, um... I, I wouldn't know specifically the four sessions, but uh, uh, as, at the time being, we're going to have four sessions. And the way I look at it, it's going to be four Fridays around the same time. This yeah. is going to be for the convenience of all. That's one. Now, the sessions would be divided so that now today you had an overview of what we saw. One of the sessions would, of course, be focusing on the... Remember, functional medicine is so wide, but... Just uh, to you to understand, one session would be on the nutrition part. One per session would be, as Praveen would be taking it on the detox part of it. One session would be on the hormones, which I'd be very happy to take. And uh, the last session, or one more session, burnout. would be on burnouts. Okay, we're going to do another burnout. So, uh, and the whole idea of attending these sessions would be for you to just start uh, changing your perspective of how you'll be looking at disease and wellness. Uh, we hope that will whet your appetite. And if this uh, initial pilot uh, project is successful with the IMA, then of course we would like to do many more uh, training, teaching programs, even certification programs. So it, it all depends upon your enthusiasm and your response. So let's see how that goes. Uh, this is a good start and thanks to uh, full marks to Dr. Preeti. I would give her the full yeah. credit for having brought this together and Dr. Anil Musa. Anil Musa does all the hard work. Okay, Praveen, you and I are, 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 are the ones that enjoy this uh, limelight. No, 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 Dr. Okay, questions. I saw a lot of yeah, interesting questions. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sarika, are you here? Uh, 
uh, before i go i go let me uh, just uh, give some idea thank you very much dr vivek and i request all of the participant please share the same message and same link we will work with the same link at the same time like friday 3 to 4 so please share this uh, message to all the colleagues and all the doctors you know who are interested and whom you think that they can join we need and so uh, we need to spread the functional medicine so yes, dr, dr. musa i have few questions for you before you leave yes can you explain how food is a messenger because i think then i will take dr vivek's question later but this is for you yeah there is a very beautiful question and you know usually in conventional thinking if we talk about the diet and all this we always think about you know calorie in and calorie out fundamental we always think about when we take in more calorie we become obese and when we reduce the calorie we become we lose the weight that is a very old fundamental nowadays medicine has changed and now food is a information food can trigger our metabolic process just a simple idea or just simple example if omega 3 and omega 6 we all know omega 3 is very much healthy so if our diet is more in omega 6 we actually inviting inflammation and that infl- that omega 6 is a message message for our inflammatory pathways if we the same take we take omega if we give omega 6 as a food we induce omega 3 as a food we induce anti inflammatory pathway so the simple example it's basically So, uh, it's not a just a calorie in calorie out it's a food right. in all respect that is an information for our body and metabolic process a very quick point and a very quick point to, here sorry yeah very yes, quick doctor. point here a lot of patients ask you look you are giving me omega 3 then they will go online and say look this is omega 3 omega 6 omega 9 and and they can keep on counting all multiples of 3 because that's how it's marketed and then this is very difficult to tell them fundamentally that actually you know you're doing more harm by taking all this so that food is a messenger also makes sense because you don't shoot the messenger <laughs> okay now the doctor <laughs> means to add to this what i will want to say is food is a messenger because food actually stimulates your genes the way the genes work is like a corporate office board meeting so dr vivek you know whenever you talk to him this line you will always catch him saying <laughs> i have to manage my board meetings so you know he is a big guy running blood pressure <laughs> right and but the board meeting thing is always a consensus majority wins similarly for genes food is messenger because the type of food you eat will decide what type of genes will get triggered and active and that will decide how well you are feeling so as dr musa said it's not energy in energy out calorie in calorie out it is burger khaoge to waise genes activate honge and agar broccoli khaoge to waise honge and that's why food is a messenger dr musa you have one more question before i can let you go and uh, the question is your optimal level of b12 is that one uh, b9 b9 right. b12 b12 and how does uh, you know what are the underlying causes for seizure and what are the optimum levels of b12 b9 and should also be supplemented with b12 when yeah so when we talk about the any nutrient and then there is a optimal range and there is standard range when we talk about the function every parameter whatever you talk about the crp or nutritional parameter they should be in optimal range so optimal range so conventional range for b12 is starting from 211 to 949 and if somebody walk with 250 of b12 and they have a chronic disease i consider there is a deficiency optimal level that you are targeting also depend upon patient genetics if the patient having an mthfr then i would like to keep their b12 on higher side normal maybe 800 maybe 700 If somebody doesn't have MTHFR, they will find within 300, 400. So even uh, functional medicine that is a personalized medicine. So we have to see uh, patient to patient, and we can decide about. But generally, I would like to keep the B12 level to more than 500 in each and every patient. Same we happen with the folate. So my optimal range for folate is more than 15 because most patients that walk in my clinic, they have some kind of methylation defect and this. Great. Thank you, Dr. Musa. and uh, because you said you have to leave early i thought i will bombard you with questions which are relevant to your topic uh, dr Thank musa you. said a very important point there is a difference between standard levels and optimal levels optimal levels and standard levels if you are going on a long journey you have to decide uh, do i go with a nice full tank or i i am okay on the way if i find a petrol tank i'll fill it up and then i'll fill half tank again half tank then that's how your efficiency will go down the question is upper end of normal upper end of normal is always optimal range 
Yes, thank you, same, same. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Vivek, there is a question for you. Yeah, it's about wellness and hormones. More yes. about wellness and hormones. Yes. So, uh, so yes, this is, uh, uh, to me, wellness, I mean, uh, I'm definitely biased. To me, remember, all of us are, uh, look, functional medicine, we're looking at the same thing from different angles, like those blind men, you know, trying to look at the elephant. But finally, the, the structure is still the same. So, I look at wellness from the hormonal point of view. Now, to explain, uh, Dr. Preeti said everything, uh, ultimately, I think in terms of board meeting, because if I handle the board, if the board is doing very well, the company does well. So think of the body, think of the hormonal system of the body. Remember, there are over a thousand hormones. It's not just those hormones that we know about. But let's take the major hormones. Let's say the body is hormone incorporated. It's an INC uh, public limited company. Your pituitary hypothalamus, that's the CMD of that company, chairman managing director. Then you have the thyroid, which is the CEO. The CEO of the body is the chief executive officer, is the thyroid. Then you have insulin with the chief operating officer. And then all the other managerial hormones come and the smaller hormones. Now, if your company is working, is not working efficiently and you're not doing well, you have two options. One is increase the number of workers, get more people to work. So you, you start giving medicines and say, okay, let's get all the uh, uh, cells to start working. Let's fix the liver, let's fix the kidneys, et cetera. The other thing is fix the management. Optimize the thyroid, optimize the insulin, so op optimize them. And to give you an example, let us say that a person has a metabolic disorder, but you call it diabetes. Let's take the insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance as a problem. Now you might think, oh, insulin resistance, so let me give metformin. That should not be the first attempt. First attempt is what determines the insulin sensitivity. The thyroids will influence that, vitamin D will influence that. So you start oh, optimizing yeah. vitamin D, thyroid, including the progesterone. So people who had uh, progesterone in the perimenopause, progesterone fall, the T3, T4 to T3 conversions fall, and the thyroid becomes uh, uh, suboptimal, then the insulin sensitivity becomes worse, and then you find cholesterol also becomes worse. So when you say, when I talk about wellness, if you can balance the hormones, first by other methods, by uh, the pyramid, the nutritional, then the proper replacement, and one of the very important things for thyroid, which I do, and I think more people will do in the future, is using T3, not aldroxane, not thyronome, but using T3, then that way you're able to manage. So if you were to look at the hormone you optimize, believe me, to me is one way of doing, so, uh, saying that wellness equals hormone. But there are many ways to do this. So go. Dr. Vivek, very beautifully put. I will just want to add one thing to this. So I majorly work on gut health. And what I've seen is, till I balance the hormones, my patient never gets 100% recovery. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of EBV, CMV, H. pylori, repeated H. pylori these days. But whatever I do, I might treat those infections, everything. Unless the hormones are put in place, the system doesn't come back. So thank you for explaining it so beautifully. And uh, Priti, the same thing applies when you talk about blood levels. The same thing that applies to hormones is optimal level. So you look at thyroid, oh, it's in the range. TSH is in the range, so it's normal. Right. Oh. We have to say, uh, look at clinically and sometimes you may have to go much lower than what you are. So that is also the difference between optimal and, and the clinical and don't always depend on the blood levels. Also the free T3, definitely. Now the free T3. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. Dr. Praveen, yeah. Dr. Thang is saying that fatty liver is a silent scream from the liver. Harbinger of metabolic syndrome. And we all agree with that. And he also says fructose is a signal for fat storage. I'd like to add about this fatty liver. Yes. We, we did some studies in MRI and what mm. we saw that it was a high levels of iron is deposited in that fatty liver also. So uh, the thing is, uh, yes, definitely the cause of metabolic syndrome, uh, we would like to uh, go deeper into that. And we would like to know whether this mitochondrial cytopathy subsequent to any metals or chemicals is the cause of that metabolic syndrome. That's the kind of thing which we are working. Because I can always tell you about simple thing. You have got, uh, because I'm, I don't want to get into that, but uh, it's a very a good question and all that. What happens is that you have got, insulin has got two arms. You have got two two arms like this and uh, this, this uh, kind of stuff. And it is linked by disulfide bridges. You have got two disulfide bridges, which link that long arm and short arm. So what happens when we have something like toxicity of mercury or cadmium or lead is that it tries to selectively uh, get into that disulfide bridge and breaks that. So that is basically one of the big kind of things takes. And uh, we believe that, yes, it has a implications. We believe that high levels of cadmium, high levels of lead also 
causing this metabolic syndrome as well as diabetes so uh, probably this is much much uh, deeper but we have got enough number of studies which we can substantiate on that thank you dr praveen thank you i think i have taken all the questions so if anybody has a question they can unmute and ask before we end we yeah, always there, yeah, there was a question on uh, body's innate ability to heal one question asked and there was a question on reduce ejection fraction and mitochondria right so uh, uh, i of course uh, i think you can take that uh, dr priti no innate dr Vick, to... please take yeah, that, okay. that... Yeah, so this is very important. Actually, what we are all talking about in functional medicine, very fundamental, whoever has asked this question has actually understood it, that you allow the body to heal, actually. We are not the healers. Remember, that's very important for you to understand. It's, you allow the body to heal. It's like sitting in a plane and thinking, I am right, I am flying the plane just because I'm sitting you know, in, in one seat over there. It doesn't uh, work that way. But there are ways in which you can improve the healing. And let's take age as one of the factors. But if you remove age as a factor, the healing ability of the, of the of thing, again, comes down to the same thing, the balance of the nutrition, the balance of the uh, detox, the hormones putting together. And there are times, and I've used this in elderly, if you want to improve the healing, particularly of the bone or prevent or, or, uh, or treat, improve healing in osteoporotic bones, you should not hesitate to use growth hormone. Now, everybody is so scared of growth hormone because at least abuse it that they stay away from this. But when the time comes, you should use them. I'm not saying that you should use them in every case. What I'm saying is there are ways in which if your body cannot produce adequately. So yes, when the healing capacity is tremendous in the body. One thing I'd like to talk about when you spoke about when, when we often give metformin, we don't realize when you give metformin and they get neuropathy and we say metformin, oh, this person is diabetic and therefore get neuropathy. Just remember what Dr. Musa said. If you give one metformin, you will suck out the B12. It will utilize B12. So those who are not deficient will suddenly become deficient. And then you will get the B12 deficiency. You get homocysteine going up and you will get secondary effects and you will try to blame metformin or some other or the disease. But actually it is hydrogenic, the way in which you have given it. You should also be aware of when you are giving any medicines, what is it doing to the bacteria or the gut? What is it doing to all the other aspects? And then the, the body can heal. Otherwise, we all we do in medicine, honestly, is actually we do interfere with the healing, but for, a, for that point of time, with good intentions. Uh, lastly, please remember the difference between a bioidentical hormone and a synthetic hormone, which we'll take in one of the sections. For example, if you say progesterone, I'm using, use progesterone. But if you use medroxy progesterone acetate and say, I'm replacing this uh, progesterone, you're in trouble. You will finally realize that they are not the same. But more on this in the sessions. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. And thank you, everybody, for uh, being here. I think this is a good start. And we look forward to seeing you next Friday at 3 p.m. sharp. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.